Okay, here we go. Just give me one second here. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. We are all ready for some more dystopia. Or have you had enough of living it? Um, anyway. <clears throat> so we are on part two, chapter three. So we'll just jump right on into it. We can come here again, said Julia. It's generally safe to use any hideout twice, but not for another month or two, of course. As soon as she woke up, her demeanor had changed. She became alert and businesslike, put her clothes on, knotted the scarlet sash about her waist, and began arranging the details of the journey home. It seemed natural to leave this to her. She obviously had a practical cunning which Winston lacked, and she seemed also to have an exhaustive knowledge of the countryside round London, stored away from innumerable, innumerable community hikes. The route she gave him was quite different from the one by which he'd come, and brought him out at a different railway station. Never go home the same way as you went out, she said, as though enunciating an important general principle. She would leave first, and Winston was to wait half an hour before following her. She had named a place where they could meet after work, four evenings hence. It was a street in one of the poorer quarters, where there was an open market which was, which was generally crowded and noisy. She would be hanging about among the stalls, pretending to be in search of shoelaces or sewing thread. If she judged that the coast was clear, she would blow her nose when, she, when he approached, otherwise he was to walk past her without recognition. But with luck, in the middle of the crowd, it would be safe to talk for a quarter of an hour and arrange another meeting. And now I must go, she said, as soon as he had mastered his instructions. I'm due back at 1930. I've got to put in two hours for the Junior Anti-Sex League, handing out leaflets or something. Isn't it bloody? Give me a brush down, would you? Have I got any twigs in my hair? 
Are you sure? Then goodbye, my love, goodbye. She flung herself into his arms, kissed him almost violently, and a moment later pushed her way through the saplings and disappeared into the wood with very little noise. Even now he had not found out her surname or her address. However, it made no difference, for it was inconceivable that they could ever meet indoors or exchange any kind of written communication. As it happened, they never went back to the clearing in the wood. During the month of May, there was only one further occasion in which they actually succeeded in making love. That was in another hiding place known to Julia, the belfry of, of a ruinous church in an almost deserted stretch of country where an atomic bomb had fallen 30 years earlier. It was a good hiding place when once you got there, but the getting there was very dangerous. For the rest, they could meet only in the streets, in a different place every evening, and never for more than half an hour at a time. In the street, it was usually possible to talk after a fashion, as they drifted down the crowded pavements, not quite abreast, and never looking at one another. They carried on a curious intermittent conversation which flicked on and off like the beams of a lighthouse, suddenly nipped into silence by the approach of a party uniform or the proximity of a telescreen, <clears throat> then taken up again minutes later in the middle of a sentence, then abruptly cut short as they parted at the agreed spot, then continued almost without introduction on the following day. Julia appeared to be quite used to this kind of conversation, which she called talking by installments. She was also surprisingly adept at speaking without moving her lips. Just once in almost a month of nightly meetings, they managed to exchange a kiss. They were passing in silence down a side street. Julia would never speak when they were away from the main streets. When there was a deafening roar, the earth heaved and the air darkened, and Winston found himself lying on his side, bruised and terrified. A rocket bomb must have dropped quite near at hand. Suddenly, he became aware of Julia's face a few center centimeters from his own. Deathly white, as white as chalk. Even her lips were white. She was dead. He clasped her against him and found that she was kissing a, he was kissing a live warm face, but there was some powdery stuff that got in the way of his lips. Both of their faces were thickly coated with plaster. There were evenings when they reached their rendezvous and then had to walk past one another without a sign because a patrol had just come around the corner or a helicopter was hovering overhead. Even, it had, even if it had been less dangerous, it would still have been difficult to find time to meet. Winston's working week was 60 hours, Julia's, Julia's was even longer, and their free days varied according to the pressure of work and did not coincide. Julia, in any case, seldom had an evening completely free. She spent an astonishing amount of time in attending lectures and demonstrations, distributing lit literature for the Junior Anti-Sex League, preparing banners for Hate Week, making collections for the savings campaign, and such like activities. It, it paid, she said. It was camouflage. If you kept the small rules, you could break the big ones. She even induced... Winston to mortgage yet another of his evenings by enrolling himself for the part-time munition work, which was done voluntarily by zealous party members. So one evening every week, Winston spent four hours of paralyzing boredom, screwing together small bits of metal which were probably parts of bomb fuses, in a drafty, ill-lit workshop where the knocking of hammers mingled drearily with the music of the telescreens. When they met in the church tour tower, <clears throat> wow. When they met in the church tower, the gaps in their fragmentary conversation were filled up. It was a blazing afternoon. The air in the little square chamber above the bells was hot and stagnant and smelt overpoweringly of pigeon dung. They sat talking for hours on the dusty, twig-littered floor, one or other of them getting up from time to time to cast a glance through the arrow slits and make sure that no one was coming. Julia was 26 years old. She lived in a hostel with 30 other girls, always in the, st in the stink of women. How I hate women, she said parenthetically. And she worked, as he had guessed, on the novel writing machines in the fiction department. She enjoyed her work, which consisted chiefly in running and servicing a powerful but tricky electromotor. She was not clever, but was fond of using her hands and felt 
at home with machinery. She could describe the whole process of composing a novel from the general directive issued by the planning committee down to the final touching up by the rewrite squad. But she was not interested in the finished product. She didn't much care for reading, she said. Books were just a commodity that had to be produced, like jam or bootlaces. She had no memories of anything before the early 60s, and the only person she had ever known who talked frequently of the days before the revolution was a grandfather who had disappeared when she was eight. At school, she had been captain of the hockey team and had won the gymnastics trophy two years running. She had been a troop leader in the spies and a branch secretary in the youth league before joining the junior anti-sex league. She had always borne an excellent character. She had even an infallible mark of good reputation been picked out to work in Pornosec, the subsection of the fiction department which turned out cheap pornography for distribution among the proles. It was nicknamed Muck House by the people who worked in it, she remarked. There she had remained for a year, helping to produce booklets in sealed packets with titles like Spanking Stories or One Night in a Girl's School, to be bought furtively by proletarian youths who were under the impression that they were buying something illegal. What are these books like? said Winston curiously. Oh, ghastly rubbish. They're boring, really. They only have six plots, but they swap them around a bit. Of course, I was only on the kaleidoscopes. I was never in the rewrite squad. I'm not literary, dear. Not even enough for that. He learned with astonishment that all the workers in Pornosec, except the heads of the department, were girls. The theory was that men, whose sex instincts were less controllable than those of women, were in greater danger of being corrupted by the filth they handled. They don't even like having married women there, she added. Girls are always supposed to be so pure. Here, here's one who isn't, anyway. <clears throat> She had had her first love affair when she was 16, with a party member of 60 who later committed suicide to avoid arrest. And a good job, too, said Julia, otherwise they'd have had my name out, out of him when he confessed. Since then, there have been various others. Life as she saw it was quite simple. You wanted a good time. They, meaning the party, wanted to stop you having it. You broke the rules as best you could. She seemed to think it was just as natural that they should want to rob you of your pleasures as that you should want to avoid being caught. She hated the party and said so in the crudest words, but she had no general criticism of it, except where it touched upon her own life. She had no interest in party doctrine. He noticed that she never used newspeak words except the ones that had passed into everyday use. She had never heard of the Brotherhood and refused to believe in its existence. Any kind of organized revolt against the party, which was bound to be a failure, struck her as stupid. The clever thing was to break the rules and stay alive all the same. He wondered vaguely how many others like her there might be in the younger generation, people who had grown up in the world of the revolution. Oh, old world charm. Hello. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hello, Old World Charm. Thank you, thank you. Does that say 29 viewers? Wow. That might very well be the biggest raid I've ever received. Thank you much. Good evening, Redhead1549. We were just... <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. We're just getting into chap our our uh, chapter here, so I'll jump back into it here. Um, he wondered vaguely how many others like her might be in the younger generation. Uh, people who, I'm sorry, let me start that again. He wa he wondered vaguely how many others like her there might be in the younger generation. People who had grown up in the world of the revolution, knowing nothing else except the party as something unalterable like the sky, not rebelling against its authority, but simply evading it as a rabbit dodges a dog. They did not discuss the possibility of getting married. It was too remote to be worth thinking about. No imaginable committee 
would ever sanction such a marriage, even if Catherine Winston's wife could somehow have been got rid of. It was hopeless, even as a daydream. I am reading 1984 um, right now. Um, and once I get to the end of a chapter or two, then I'm going to go over to um, Hogwarts Legacy, actually. So if you want to stick around, you get to hear a little bit of what 1984 is like. You read it at school. See, I never did. And so this is all brand new territory for me. <clears throat> so since you have read it, you may remember um, at this point, they're sitting in the steeple of a church, an abandoned, bombed out church, and having a discussion. So, um, what was she like, your wife, said Julia. She was, do you know the new speak word, Good thinkful, meaning naturally orthodox, incapable of thinking a bad thought. No, I didn't know the word, but I know the kind of person right enough. He began telling her the story of his married life, but curiously enough, she appeared to know the essential parts of it already. She described to him almost as though she had seen or felt it, the stiffening of Catherine's body as soon as he touched her, the way in which she still seemed to be pushing him from her with all her strength, even when her arms were clasped tightly around him. With Julia, he felt no difficulty in talking about such things. Catherine, in any case, had long ceased to be a painful memory and become merely a distasteful one. It's certainly been a long, uh, a, a while since you read. Okay, yeah, sure. I could have stood, I could have stood it if I hadn't been... If it hadn't been for one thing, he said, he told her about the frigid little ceremony that Catherine had forced him to go through on the same night every week. She hated it, but nothing would make her stop doing it. She used to call it, but you'll never guess. Our duty to the party, said Julia promptly. How did you know that? I've been at school too, dear. Sex talks once a month for the over 16s and in the youth movement. They rub it in to you for years. I dare say it works in a lot of cases, but of course you can never tell. People are such hypocrites. She began to enlarge upon the subject. With Julia, everything came back to her own sexuality. As soon as this was touched upon in any way, she was capable of great acuteness. Unlike Winston, she had grasped the inner meaning of the party's sexual puritanism. It was not merely that the sex instinct created a world of its own, which was outside the party's control, and which therefore had to be destroyed if possible. What was more important was that sexual privation induced hysteria, which was desirable because it, would be, it could be transformed into war fever and leader worship. The way she put it was, when you make love, you're using an up energy, and afterwards you feel happy and don't give a damn for anything. They can't bear you to feel like that. They want you to be bursting with energy all the time. All this marching up and down and cheering and waving flags is simply sex gone sour. If you're happy inside yourself, why should you get excited about Big Brother and the three-year plans and the two minutes hate and all the rest of this bloody rot? That was very true, he thought. There was a direct intimate connection between chastity and political orthodoxy. For how could the fear, the hatred, and the lunatic credulity which the party needed in its members be kept at the right pitch except for, by bottling down some powerful instinct and using it as a driving force? The sex impulse was dangerous to the party, and the party had turned it to account. They had played a similar trick with the instinct of parenthood. The family could not actually be abolished, and indeed people were encouraged to be fond of their children— in almost the old-fashioned way. The children, on the other hand, were systematically turned against their parents and taught to spy on them and report their deviations. The family had become, in effect, an extension of the thought police. It was a device by means of which everyone could be surrounded night and day by informers who knew him intimately. Abruptly, his mind went back to Catherine. 
Catherine would unquestionably have denounced him to the thought police if she had not happened to be too stupid to detect the unorthodoxy of his opinions. But what really recalled her to him at this moment was the stifling heat of the afternoon, which had brought the sweat out on his forehead. He began telling Julia of something that had happened, or rather had failed to happen, on another sweltering summer afternoon eleven years ago. It was three or four months after they were married. They had lost their way on a community hike somewhere in Kent. They had only lagged behind the others for a couple of minutes, but they took a wrong turn, and presently found themselves pulled up short by the edge of an old chalk quarry. It was a sheer drop of ten or twenty meters, with boulders at the bottom. There was nobody of whom they could ask the way. As soon as she realized that they were lost, Catherine became very uneasy. To be away from the noisy mob of hikers, even for a moment, gave her a feeling of wrongdoing. She wanted to hurry back by the way they had come and start searching in the other direction. But at this moment, Winston noticed some tufts of lustrif growing in the cracks of the cliff beneath them. One tuft was of two colors, magenta and brick red apparently growing on the same root. He had never seen anything of the kind before, and he called to Catherine to come and look at it. Look, Catherine, look at those flowers. That clump down near the bottom, do you see? They're two different colors. She had already turned to go, but he did. she did rather fretfully come back for a moment. She even leaned out over the cliff face to see where he was pointing. He was standing a little behind her, and he put his hand on her waist to steady her. At this moment, it suddenly occurred to him how completely alone they were. There was not a human creature anywhere, not a leaf stirring, not even a bird awake. In a place like this, the danger that there would be a hidden microphone was very small, and even if there was a microphone, it would only pick up sounds. It was the hottest, sleepiest hour of the afternoon. The sun blazed down upon them, the sweat trickled his face, and the thought struck him. Why didn't you give her a good shove, said Julia. I would have. Yes, dear, you would have. I would if I'd seen the same, sorry, the same person then as I am now. Or perhaps I would. I'm not certain. Are you sorry you didn't? Yes. On the whole, I'm sorry I didn't. They were sitting side by side on the dusty floor. He pulled her closer against him. Her head rested on his shoulder. The pleasant smell of her hair conquering the pigeon dung. She was very young, he thought. She still expected something from life. She did not understand that to push an inconvenient person over a cliff solves nothing. Actually, it would have made no difference, he said. Then why are you sorry you didn't do it? Only because I prefer a positive to a negative. In this game that we're playing, we can't win. Some kinds of failure are better than other kinds, that's all. He felt her shoulder give a wiggle of dissent. She always contradicted him when he said anything of this kind. She would not accept it as a law of nature that the individual is always defeated. In a way, she realized that she herself was doomed, that sooner or later the thought police would catch her and kill her. But with another part of her mind, she believed that it was somehow possible to construct a secret world in which you could live as you chose. All you needed was luck and cunning and boldness. She did not understand that there was no such thing as happiness, that the only victory lay in the far future, long after they were dead, that from the moment of declaring war on the party, it was better to think of yourself as a corpse. We are the dead, he said. We're not dead yet, said Julia, prosaically. Not physically. Six months, a year, five years, conceivably. I'm afraid of death. You are young, so presumably you're more afraid of it than I am. Obviously, we shall put it off as long as we can, but it makes very little difference. So long as human beings stay human, death and life are the same thing. Oh, rubbish. Which would you sooner sleep with, me or a skeleton? Don't you enjoy being alive? Don't you like feeling? This is me. This is my hand. This is my leg. I'm real. I'm solid. I'm alive. Don't you like this? She twisted herself round and pressed her bosom against him. He could feel her breasts ripe yet firm through her overalls. Her body seemed to be pouring some of its youth and vigor into his. Yes, I like that, he said. Then stop talking about dying 
And now listen, dear, we've got to put up about the next... What? We, oh, I'm sorry. I misread that. We've got to fix up about the next time we meet. We may as well go back to the place in the wood. We've given it a good long rest, but you must get there by a different way this time. I've got it all planned out. You take the train, but look, I'll draw it out for you. And in her practical way, she scraped together a small square of dust and with a twig from a pigeon's nest began drawing a map on the floor. And that's the end of chapter chapter three of part two um how long we've been 25 yeah we're i'm going to keep going for another chapter so i thank all of you that are hanging out um chapter four winston looked round the shabby little room above mr carrington's shop beside the window the enormous bed was made up with ragged blankets and a coverless bolster the old-fashioned clock with the 12-hour hand was ticking away on the mantelpiece in the corner, on the gate-leg table, the glass paperweight which he had bought on his last visit gleamed softly out of the half-darkness. In the fender was a battered tin oil stove, a saucepan, and two cups, provided by Mr. Charrington. Winston lit the burner and set a pan of water to boil. He had brought an envelope full of victory coffee and some saccharin tablets. The, the clock's hand said... 1720 it was night it was 19 1920 really she was coming at 1930 folly folly his heart kept saying conscious gratuitous suicidal folly of all the crimes that a party member could commit this one was the least possible to conceal actually the idea had first floated into his head in the form of a vision of the glass paperweight mirrored by the surface of the gate-leg table. As he had foreseen, Mr. Charrington had made no difficulty about letting the room. He was obviously glad of the few dollars that it would bring him. Nor did he seem shocked or become offensively knowing when it was made clear that Winston wanted the room for the purpose of a love affair. Instead, he looked into the middle distance and spoke in generalities with so delicate an air as to give the impression that he had become partly invisible. Privacy, he said, was a very valuable thing. Everyone wanted a place where they could be alone occasionally, and when they had such a place, it was only common courtesy in anyone else who knew of it to keep his knowledge to himself. He even seeming almost to fade out of existence as he did so, added that there were two en entries to the house, one of them brought uh, through the backyard, which gave on an alley. Under the window, somebody was singing. Winston peeped out, secure in the protection of the muslin curtain. The June sun was still high in the sky, and in the sun-filled court below, a monstrous woman, solid as a Norman pillar, with brawny red forearms and a sacking apron strapped about her middle, was stumping to and fro between a wash tub and a clothesline, pegging out a series of square white things which Winston recognized as baby's diapers. Whenever her mouth was not corked with clothespins, she was singing in a powerful contralato. It was only an hopeless fancy. It passed like an April dye. But a look on a w word on the dreams they stirred. They have stolen my heart away. A why. A why. <laughs> uh, it's always weird to read lyrics like that. The tune had been haunting London for weeks past. It was one of countless similar songs published for the benefit of the proles by a subsection of the music department. The words of these songs were composed without any human intervention, whatever, on an instrument known as a versificator. But the woman sang so tunefully as to turn the dreadful rubbish into an almost pleasant sound. He could hear the woman singing and the scrape of her shoes on the flagstones, and the cries of the children in the street, and somewhere in the far distance a faint roar of traffic. And yet the room seemed curiously silent, thanks to the absence of a telescreen. <clears throat> folly 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 he thought again it was inconceivable that they could frequent this place for more than a few weeks without being caught but the temptation of having a hiding place was truly their own that that was truly their own 
indoors and near at hand, had been too much for both of them. For some time after their visit to the church, Belfry, it had been possible to arrange meetings. Impossible to arrange meetings, sorry. Working hours had been drastically increased in anticipation of hate week. It was more than a month distant, but the enormous complex preparations that it entailed were throwing extra work onto everybody. Finally, both of them managed to secure a free afternoon on the same day. They had agreed to go back to the clearing in the wood. On the evening beforehand, they met briefly in the street. As usual, Winston hardly looked at Julia, as they drifted toward one another in the crowd, but from the short glance he gave her, it seemed to him that she was paler than usual. "'It's all off,' she murmured, as soon as she judged it was safe to speak. "'Tomorrow, I mean. "'What? "'Tomorrow afternoon. "'I can't come. "'Why not?' Oh, the usual reason. It started early this time. For a moment, he was violently angry. During the month that he had known her, the nature of his desire for her had changed. At the beginning, there had been little true sensuality in it. Their first lovemaking had been simply an act of the will. But after the second time, it was different. The smell of her hair, the taste of her mouth, the feeling of her skin seemed to have got inside him or into the air all around him she had become a physical necessity something that he not only wanted but felt that he had a right to when she said that she could not come he had the feeling that she was cheating him but just at this moment the crowd pressed them together and their hands accidentally met she gave the tips of his fingers a quick squeeze that seemed to invite not desire but affection it struck him that when one lived with a woman, this particular disappointment must be a normal recurring event, and a deep tenderness such as he had not felt for her before suddenly took hold of him. He wished that they were a married couple of ten years standing. He wished that they were walking through the streets with her. Uh, he wished that he were walking through the streets with her just as they were doing now, but openly and without fear talking of trivialities and buying odds and ends for the household. He wished above all that they had some place where they could be alone together without feeling the obligation to make love every time they met. It was not actually at that moment, but at some time on the following day that the idea of renting Mr. Charrington's room had occurred to him. When he suggested it to Julia, she had agreed with unexpected readiness. Both of them knew that this was lunacy. It was as though they were intentionally stepping nearer to their graves. As he sat waiting on the edge of the bed, he thought again of the cellars of the Ministry of Love. It was curious how that predestined horror moved in and out of one's consciousness. There it lay, fixed in future times, preceding death as surely as 99 precedes 100. One could not avoid it, but one could perhaps postpone it. And yet, instead, every now and again, by a conscious, willful act, one chose to shorten the interval before it happened. <clears throat> At this moment, there was a quick step on the stairs. Julia burst into the room. She was carrying a tool bag of coarse brown canvas, such as he had sometimes seen her carrying to and fro at the ministry. He started forward to take her in his arms, but she disengaged herself rather hurriedly, partly because she was still holding the tool bag. Half a second, she said. Just let me show you what I brought. Did you bring some of that filthy victory coffee? I thought you would. You could chuck it away again, because we shan't be needing it. Look here. She fell on her knees, threw open the bag, and tumbled out some spanners and a screwdriver that filled the top part of it. Underneath were a number of neat paper packets. The first packet that she passed to Winston had a strange and yet vaguely familiar feeling. It was filled with some kind of heavy sand-like stuff, which yielded wherever you touched it. It isn't sugar, he said. Real sugar, not saccharine sh sugar. And here's a loaf of bread, proper white bread, not our bloody stuff, and a little pot of jam. And here's a tin of milk. But look, this is the one I'm really proud of. I had to wrap a bit of sacking around it because she had not... she. But she did not need to tell him why she had wrapped it up. The smell was already filling the room. A rich, hot smell which seemed like an emanation from his early childhood. Oh. Hello. <clears throat> um. 
but which one did not occasionally uh, meet with the with even now blowing down a passageway before a door slammed or diffusing itself mysteriously in a crowded street sniffed for an instant and then lost again it's coffee he murmured real coffee it's inner party coffee there's a whole kilo here she said how did you manage to get hold of all these things Hey, Super Nambro, how you doing? It's all inner party stuff. There's nothing those swine don't have. Nothing. But of course, waiters and servants and people pinch things. And look, I got a little packet of tea as well. Winston had squatted down beside her. He tore open a corner of the packet. It's real tea, not blackberry leaves. There's been a lot of tea about lately. They've captured India or something, she said vaguely but listen dear i want you to turn your back on me for three minutes go and sit on the other side of the bed don't go too near the window and don't turn around till i tell you winston gazed abstractedly through the muslin curtain down in the yard the red-armed woman was still marching to and fro between the wash tub and the line she took two more pegs out of her mouth and sang with deep feeling they say that time eels all things they say you can always forget, but the smiles on the tears across the years, they twist my art strings yet. She knew the whole driveling song by heart, it seemed. Her voice floated upward with a sweet summer air, very tuneful, charged with a sort of happy melancholy. One had the feeling that she would have been perfectly content if the June evening had been endless and the supply of clothes inexhaustible, to remain there for a thousand years, pegging out diapers and singing rubbish. It struck him as a curious fact that he had never heard a member of the party singing alone and spontaneously. It would even have seemed slightly unorthodox, a dangerous eccentricity like talking to oneself. Perhaps it was only when people were somewhere near the starvation level that they had anything to sing about. You can turn around now, said Julia. He turned around and for a second almost failed to recognize her. What he had actually expected was to see her naked, but she was not naked. The transformation that had happened was much more surprising than that. She had painted her face. She must have slipped into some shop in the proletarian quarters and bought herself a complete set of makeup materials. Her lips were deeply reddened, her cheeks rouged, her nose powdered. There was even a touch of something under the eyes to make them brighter. It was not very skillfully done, but Winston's standards in such matters were not high. He had never before seen or imagined a woman of the party with cosmetics on her face. The improvement in her appearance was startling. With just a few dabs of color in the right places, she had become not only very much prettier, but, above all, far more feminine. Her short hair and boyish overalls merely added to the effect. As he took her in his arms, a wave of synthetic violets flooded his nostrils. He remembered the half-darkness of a basement kitchen and a woman's cavernous mouth. It was the very same scent that she had used, but at the moment it did not seem to matter. Scent too, he said. Yes, dear, scent too. And do you know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to get hold of a real woman's frock for some, from somewhere and wear it instead of these bloody trousers. I'll wear silk stockings and high-heeled shoes. In this room, I'm going to be a woman, not a party comrade. They flung their clothes off and climbed into the huge mahogany bed. It was the first time that he had stripped himself naked in her presence until now he had been too much ashamed of his pale and meager body excuse me with the varicose veins standing out on his calves and a discolored patch over his ankle there were no sheets but the blanket they were on was threadbare and smooth and the size of the sp and springiness of the bed astonished both of them it's sure to be a full of bugs but who cares said julia one never saw a double bed nowadays, except in the homes of the proles. Winston had occasionally slept in one of his in his boyhood. Julia had never seen one before, so far as she could remember. Presently they fell asleep for a little while. 
When Winston woke up, the hands of the clock had crept round to nearly nine. He did not stir, because Julia was sleeping with her head in the crook of his arm. Most of her makeup had transferred itself to his own face or the bolster, but a light stain of rouge still brought out the beauty of her cheekbone. A yellow ray from the sinking sun fell across the foot of the bed and lighted up the fireplace, where the water in the pan was boiling fast. Down in the yard the woman had stopped singing, but the faint shouts of children floated in from the street. He wondered vaguely whether in the abolished past it had been a normal experience to be in bed like this in the cool of a summer evening, a man and a woman with no clothes on, making love when they chose, talking of what they chose, not feeling any compulsion to get up, simply lying there and listening to peaceful sounds outside. Surely there could never have been a time when this that seemed ordinary. Julia woke up, rubbed her eyes, and raised herself on her elbow to look at the oil stove. Half that water's boiled away, she said. I'll get up and make some coffee in another moment. We've got an hour. What time do they cut the lights off at your flats? 23.30. It's 23 at the hospital, hostel, but you have to get in earlier than that because... Hi, get out, you filthy brute! She suddenly twisted herself over in the bed, seized a shoe from the floor, and sent it hurtling into the corner with a boyish jerk of her arm, exactly as he had seen her fling the dictionary at Goldstein that morning during the two minutes' hate. What was it, he said in surprise. A rat. I saw him stick his beastly nose out of the wainscoting. There's a hole down there. I, I gave him a good fright anyway. Rats, murmured Winston. In this room? They're all over, over the place, said Julia indifferently as she lay down again. We've even got them in the kitchen at the hostel. Some parts of London are swarming with them. Did you know they attack children? Yes, they do. In some of these streets... Oh, a woman daren't leave a baby alone for two minutes. It's the great huge brown ones that do it. And the nasty thing is that the brutes always... Don't go on, said Winston, with his eyes tightly shut. Dearest, you've gone quite pale. What's the matter? Do they make you feel sick? Of all the horrors in the world, a rat. She pressed herself against him and wound her limbs around him, as though to reassure him with the warmth of her body. He did not reopen his eyes immediately. For several moments he had had the feeling of being back in a nightmare which had recurred from time to time throughout his life. It was always very much the same. He was standing in front of all the darkness and all the other and on the other side of it there was something unendurable, something too dreadful to be faced. In the dream his deepest feeling was always one of self deception, because he did in fact know what was behind the wall of darkness. With a deadly effort, like wrenching a piece out of his own brain, he could even have dragged the thing into the open. He always woke up without discovering what it was, but somehow it was connected with what jo Julia had been saying when he cut her short.
no audio. Uh, okay. Did anybody else lose audio? Your uh, they're, they're showing. My roommate just said that my audio wasn't coming through and neither the captions, but everything looks good on my end. So, does anybody else lose anything? Uh, okay. <laughs> Guess it was just his computer. I can hear you now. Oh, you couldn't for a minute there? Um, oh, it could be. Could have been. Um, it didn't show any anything on my end, but... Um, I was paying more attention to the book than the stream, so. Uh, let's see, where were we? We were talking, looking at the picture. Oh, St. Clement's, Clement Danes. Uh, the fragment of the rhyme that Dr., uh, that, now I lost it. <sighs> Let me start that uh, over. It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement Danes, its name was. The fragment of rhyme that Mr. Charrington had taught him came back into his head, and he added half nostalgically, Orange and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. To his astonishment, she capped the line, You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey? I can't remember how it goes on after that, but anyway. I remember it ends up, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was like the two halves of a countersign. But there must be another line after the bells of Old Bailey. Perhaps it could be dug out of Mr. Charrington's memory if he were suitably prompted. Who taught you that, he said. My grandfather. He used to say it to me when I was a little girl. He was vaporized when I was eight. At any rate, he disappeared. I wonder what a lemon was, she added inconsequently. I've seen oranges. They're a kind of round yellow fruit with a thick skin. I can remember lemons, said Winston. They were quite common in the 50s. They were so sour that it set your teeth on edge even to smell them. I bet that picture's got bugs behind it, said Julia. I'll take it down and give it a good clean some day. I suppose it's almost time we were leaving. I must start washing this paint off. What a bore. I'll get the lipstick stick off your face afterwards. Winston did not get up for a few minutes more. The room was darkening. He turned over toward the light and lay gazing into the glass paperweight. The inexhaustibly interesting thing was not the fragment of coral, but the interior of the glass itself. There was such a depth of it, and yet it was almost as transparent as air. It was as though the surface of the glass had been the arch of the sky, enclosing a tiny world with its atmosphere complete. He had the feeling that he could get inside it, and that in fact he was inside it, along with the mahogany bed and the gate-leg table, and the clock and the steel engraving and the paperweight itself. The paperweight was the room he was in, and the coral was Julia's life and his own, fixed in a sort of eternity at the heart of the crystal. And that is the end of chapter four of part two. So we will leave it off there. Uh, we made it in a little under an hour. So we did pretty good. And uh, sorry if it was buffering there. I hope nobody missed anything too much as far as the text. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to take, take a break, get my adult beverage ready to go and uh, come back for another stream and play some Hogwarts Legacy. So thank you again, Raiders. Um, I forgot I was going to give, um, I was going to give Old World Charm a shout out and I didn't because um, I'm an idiot and I f always, I always have to look up my notes on how to even do that. <laughs> I don't know why it won't stick in my head. Super Nambro taught me how to do it, but um, so let me go ahead and do it now. The more I do it, the um, old world charm. I think I did that right. 
There you go. I should have done it when I when the Raiders first came in. Uh, sorry about that. But um, yeah, thank you for coming in. I'll be back reading this book again on Tuesday. So the next couple chapters, if you want to tune in, I'd very much appreciate it. And I will see you in a little bit for the next stream. Thank you.